topic is going to be on today. We're going to go through some different dosing of some of the different direct thrombin inhibitors and then briefly go through some of the clinical trials and the use of direct thrombin inhibitors in ACS or acute coronary syndrome as well as HIT. So this is a picture I'm sure you all um, have seen before. It is a picture of the clotting cascade. So on the left, you have your um, tissue factor pathway or kind of where you would imagine in the clot happening. And then on the right, you have the um, intrinsic pathway. And so essentially, you can kind of follow down through each different one of the clotting factors, but you can see they both end up resulting in thrombin. And then thrombin is one of the last few steps of the clotting cat cascades. Um, it cleaves fibrinogen into fibrin, and then this fibrin then cross-leaks platelets via the two GP2B3A receptor. And this is all what helps basically form the hemostatic plug or a clot. This is just another way to kind of depict what thrombin does and how it's generated. So again, tissue factor pathway leads to thrombin formation, um, and the tissue factor pathway also leads to the formation of factors 9, 11, and 8. And thrombin basically continues um, to give feedback to these three factors so that it continues to have um, fibrin formation. So it's kind of an extra thing that thrombin does, um, which is kind of that negative feedback loop you see um, right here in the middle. And then your body's natural anticoagulants, so activated protein C and protein S, actually help confine the clot to its site of injury um, so that it doesn't spread anywhere else in the body. So the role of thrombin, um, particularly in acute coronary syndrome, is that it's an important target because it helps prevent the fibrin clot um, that we talked about forming, but it also helps prevent secretion of tissue factor and cross-linking receptors such as the 2B3As to cause further platelet um, buildup. So this list basically just goes through the pictures we just saw. So again, it, one of its main roles is converting fibrinogen to fibrin, um, and then it also activates factor 13, which is stabilizing the fibrin clot by cross-linking strands, activates factor 8 and 5, which helps enhance the production of thrombin, and then finally it has platelet activation as well um, because it secretes tissue factors which have 2B3 receptors on them. So this is just um, a little more picture of what would you would think is happening in a PCI procedure. So a PCI procedure is a percutaneous intervention. Um, you often hear just people calling it a catheterization Catheterization is actually just the diagnostic procedure to see if someone might need a PCI. So we cath a lot of patients, which is essentially entering either in through the femoral artery or the radial artery with a catheter that has almost a, um, has something on the end of it that releases dye for us to better visualize coronary arteries. And so PCI is done if we actually find a lesion that needs to have an intervention on. So it's important to remember that PCI itself is inherently extremely thrombogenic. Um, not only is there a high likelihood that thrombus is already present in patients with ACS, which is why they come in with chest pain or positive cardiac enzymes, but the treatment of choice, PCI, may actually disrupt the thrombus, causing distal embolization, um, and this can potentiate thrombosis somewhere other than the initial site of injury. They've actually developed some interesting devices for this um, that they try to use occasionally and they, if they think someone's at high risk of already having a thrombus burden or a large thrombus burden, they'll use these almost little screens that on the end of these catheters that help catch some of that thrombus if it's um, disrupted during a PCI. Um, angioplasty, which is essentially balloon, um, ballooning the area of where you have blockage, which is essentially putting a balloon in and inflating it and kind of smashing the blockage against the wall, um, as well as stinting, which is a little more permanent than ballooning because it's actually putting something there to kind of keep it pushed against a wall rather than just doing a balloon and, um, you know, kind of pushing things out of the way. Um, but both of these produce deep vessel wall injury and plaque disruption. 
Um, in addition, just in general, the catheters and devices that you're using to end the arteries are foreign materials, and therefore just the fact that they're foreign materials makes them thrombogenic. Um, and can activate the clotting cascade. So all these factors can potentially trigger coagulation resulting in thrombogenic generation, platelet activation, and a systemically detectable inflammatory response. So this slide is a little more about thrombin and kind of anti-thrombin. So um, it kind of tells you the difference between heparin and direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, so normally antithrombin deactivation of the clotting cascade pathway is pretty slow, but essentially the way that heparin works is it binds to antithrombin and induces a conformational change that makes this happen much quicker and much more often than it normally does um, when the body's taking care of a clot on its own. Um, and so the difference in how direct thrombin inhibitors work is they um, can either be bivalent or they can be um, univalent. And essentially, they bind to an active site of thrombin um, or the enzyme thrombin. And so in the lower panel, the heparin um, antithrombin complex cannot bind the fibrin-bound thrombin. So that's one of the big limitations with heparin. However, the the um, direct thrombin inhibitor, as you can see, can continue to bind the, um, the fibrin-bound thrombin um, and also the free-circulating thrombin as it's showing in the top frame. So that's one of the big advantages of direct thrombin inhibitors over heparin is that if, if, if already bound, heparin really can't do anything to something that's already bound to the fi fibrin. It'll only do something to the circulating thrombin through the enzyme antithrombin, so it makes it a little bit slower. While direct thrombin inhibitors bind directly to the thrombin as well as they can bind directly to thrombin that's already attached to the fibrin. And usually a blood clot already has attached to the fibrin, um, the thrombin's already attached to the fibrin, so this is why direct thrombin inhibitors are useful. So, other heparin limitations, um, other than just not inhibiting fibrin bound thrombin, has nonlinear pharmacokinetics. The dose response is variable. Um, the volume distribution of heparin mimics total blood volume, and so dosing in obese patients can be very difficult because we know that we need to dose them on their actual body weight, but occasionally they're, um, they don't get their total blood volume, doesn't distribute all the way into fatty tissue. So sometimes we could be overdosing those patients, but we know that if we use an ideal body weight or adjusted body weight, we, we could also potentially be underdosing them as well. Um, there's also heparin resistance in patients that get a large amount of heparin um, or just have other comorbidities. You can give lots and lots of doses of heparin and not get the response that you want. And in the cath lab, this is, this is found out by when they test the point of care ACTs or activated clotting time to see if they're where they want to be with the heparin um, when they're trying to do an intervention on a patient. Um, essentially, this is deemed to be heparin resistance and would be a good reason to go ahead and try to use a direct thrombin inhibitor instead of heparin. Heparin also has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which we know is an issue in several patients. And so this is essentially a um, platelet activation where a heparin PF4 antibody complex forms and binds up platelets and almost essentially like chews them and gets rid of them um, and sends them to places that we don't want them to go. And it essentially makes patients at risk of thrombosis. And again, here we are forced to use direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, as these are the treatment of choice because they are, have not been linked to um, causing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So bivalrudin is one of the most common direct thrombin inhibitors that we currently use. It is dosed most often in PCI, but as we'll discuss in a second, it's also dosed in um, non-PCI patients who are HIP patients. And so whether we're dosing it in PCI, you give it basically a bolus dose of 0.75 mg per kg. You can give this additional 0.3 mg per kg if you don't get the ACT result that you need, but we don't often see that happening. 
And then following that bolus dose, you start a 1.75 mg per kick continuous infusion until the end of the case. If there are a dialysis patient, they get a, another dose of 0.25 mg per kick per hour, not the full dose because it is about 20% renally cleared. There is a dosing for creatinine clearance less than 30 of 1 mg per kick per hour, but typically most cath labs don't use this as it hasn't been well studied. Um, and most patients just use the HT dose and the normal dose. We, again, we monitor the ACT or the APTT if we're using it for HIT, and we'll talk about that shortly. There's really no antidote for rapid reversal like there is for heparin. You know, we use protamine for heparin. Quick onset of action, half-life's very short, so that's very important because we need to remember that when we turn this drug off, we don't have much time to have residual effects. So if you're you know, trying to get an antiplatelet like Plavix or Effiant on board, you're going to need to think about the fact when you turn bivalrudin off, you may not have any protection for that period of time that you're trying to let those oral drugs have their onset. And obviously, the half-life's um, longer in patients that have impaired renal function. So this slide basically shows um, the percent aggregation response to activators, so essentially inhibit inhibition of platelet aggregation. And so you can see that um, even at small bivalrudin concentrations, you get a large amount of thrombin, collagen, and ADP um, response, and then the thrombin response can quickly taper off once you get to the higher concentrations, but the ADP and collagen kind of stick around. Ergotraban is another direct thrombin inhibitor. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because we don't use it that often at our hospital, um, and we don't use it often in ACS. If anything, we would use it in HIP patients more often. I've actually never seen it used in ACS. Here's the dosing, and there's no need for me to read through this. Um, for monitoring of this, it is the same as bivalrudin. However, the one difference in this and bivalrudin is that ergotraban has an extreme um, effect on a patient's INR. So giving a agrachaban and, and warfarin at the same time um, is going to make your INR go up um, a good amount. So if you ever have a, someone that is on warfarin and your agrachaban concomitantly and you're trying to transition them over to the warfarin, there's instructions that you must be on a certain dose for agrachaban and the warfarin needs to have an INR targeted to four and then you turn the agachaban drip off and check an INR again six hours later. Um, and that's kind of where that formula down under the monitoring comes from. And essentially that INR six hours later should be somewhere in the range between two and three. This drug's hepatically cleared, and it is um, contraindicated in people with severe hepatic impairment, and it's also dosed differently if you have um, moderate hepatic impairment. So that's one thing to keep in mind as well. Renal dosing is not used in this medication. Leperudin, again, not going to spend much time here. It's not actually approved in PCI or ACS patients. Um, has a very short half-life. It is renally cleared. We actually removed this from formulary from our hospital um, because of the risk of a conform antibodies against itself. Um, and it's just not a very easy drug to use. So we actually ended up removing this from formulary. Dabigatran's probably the newest direct thrombin inhibitor. So this actually currently doesn't have any approved dosing in PCI patients. It is renally dosed in creatinine clearance less than 30 in atrial fibrillation patients with 75 milligrams twice a day, um, with the normal dose being 150 milligrams twice a day. Really no true monitoring here. As you are well aware, this is, was approved for no monitoring um, against warfarin. No antidote for immediate reversal. Does have a quick onset of two hours, and it's about 80% renally cleared. There has been a few studies done with the Bigotran in ACS patients, um, but one of the main issues with the Bigotran in ACS patients is that we know that the RELI study, its major AFib trial, actually found an increased risk of MIs, and a post hoc analysis actually helped confirm this finding. So um, probably shouldn't be in this lecture because.